have here is a 1961 Channel Master cassette player, recorder, more of a dictation device than anything. Um, it seems to work except for the function that erases the tape after you um, record onto it. So if it's a fresh tape, it works great. Otherwise, it just um, it doesn't erase anything. So you can have track over track over track, and it just doesn't sound right. So I got this in the original box, actually close to the original box. It's really not the correct one. But I have the original case, manual, um, headphone, and carrying strap, in addition to the leather case that holds the microphone that I'm missing. I also got two tapes to go with it. This is identical to the Channel Master 6546 that Cassette Master has uploaded to YouTube. And, um, and what's really cool about this unit is it has infinite variable speeds. For example, I can slow it down and it records at a much um, slower speed, or I can slow it down even more. <laughs> but returning to normal speed, um, we'll talk a little bit about how it has. Um, it has basic standard uh, rewind, stop, play, and record uh, functionality through a rotating knob. Um, it has a volume switch or volume knob with nine there are nine different uh, settings. Um, from what I can tell, you can also record the uh, record volume using the volume knob. It seems to be linked to the same circuitry somehow. This particular unit, common to many Japanese electronics of the time period, was designed to be used with rechargeable batteries in addition to alkaline pen light batteries. There is a jack on the reverse side of it, or the back side of it, that lets you charge the device. Um, and I don't have that charging capability. I don't have the, the power supply that goes to it, so... Um, anyway, what we're going to do now is we're going to put in a tape that was recorded, I believe, in 1965 on this very unit. And uh, you'll get to hear what it sounded like when it was new. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the microphone. I'm using the earphone as a microphone. It's not ideal, but it works. So, alright, here we go. While the tape gets rewound, um, I'll talk a little bit about the unit. Um, it's in excellent condition uh, for sitting in a New England outdoor shed um, in extreme temperatures, hot and cold. No insulation, and we get some pretty cold winters up this way. Um, so it's been sitting there for, I would estimate, around probably at, at the minimum 20 years and um, it hasn't really been used if I were to hazard a guess in approximately 45 years prior to my acquisition. The unit was actually given to me by my step-grandmother um, back in 1999 or so. And I got this along with some old camera equipment, uh, 8mm splicing machine, um, a couple of beautiful old Polaroid land cameras. And I got all the tapes that went to this unit, but I never knew what they were for, and I believe I had lost them many years ago. Um, it wasn't until my grandfather passed away, God rest his soul, um, about two days ago. Yesterday, no, he, no, he passed away yesterday morning. 
and we were going through his stuff, and um, we finally located this this device. And um, even though it didn't technically uh, belong to him per se or anyone in my family, it was given to me by my grandmother, his wife, uh, um, about ten years ago. And I'm just grateful that I finally found it. <laughs> and that having been said, um, I I literally. It, it hasn't been used in decades, maybe 45 years, if I were to to guess. Um, I put it in my car, and I went to a gas station. I picked up four alkaline batteries, four energizers, and popped them right in. And it actually roared to life. I could not believe it. And I figured out why it still works. The mechanism is so simple that there really isn't much that could possibly go wrong with it. The mechanism is incredibly simple in design and that is why it works. Um, simplicity lasts, which is why when you buy a say a German car you may end up spending millions of dollars in repairs by the time the car finally gives up um, because they're so complicated. Uh, this is a dead simple mechanism. It's actually similar in the tapes themselves are similar to um, to standard audio cassettes, but what makes them special? See what it is. All right, here's what it really is. There's two open reels mounted side by side, and they link over. So it's a continuous tape, and it just links diagonally in the middle here. And the motor is technically a rim drive mechanism. Uh, the, the the driving mechanism is, is a is a rim drive mechanism. So if you look on the inside between the two reels, each reel has a rubber pad that encircles the reel. And when the motor when the tape is slid in, the motor shaft slides along this groove and it actually lines up right here where this hole is. And when you engage the play or rewind uh, motion. The motor shaft rubs against the rim of the pulley and drives the appropriate side. And because of this elongated hole, it gives the motor the ability to go back and forth and it locks the tape in place. Pretty ingenious, if you ask me. And uh, for 1961 Japan, uh, this was pretty cutting edge. Um, I'm now going to play to you the dialogue that was on the other side of the tape that I just recorded onto. Um, and like I said, I, I'm i not 100% positive, but this unit is supposed to erase the tape as it's recording, just like a modern cassette player. The problem is, I think the erase head is either not getting power or something is going very wrong with it um, because it is not erasing the tapes when I record onto them. And that might actually be why it was shelved for so many years. It could have a defect that was never caught. And um, But it records very well on a blank tape. It wouldn't take much to fix that record head. Um, before we go and, and, and start playing this next section, I'm going to show you what the unit looks like outside of the case and we're going to take a look at the battery compartment. This is where things usually go very wrong for vintage electronics because the earlier pen light batteries or alkaline batteries were notorious for leaking. In fact, they were guaranteed to leak. There was a little certificate of guarantee in every pack of batteries that it will leak and destroy your electronics. Modern batteries do not leak like they used to. They can still vent, but not anywhere near the, uh, the level of leakiness that the older batteries were known for. The unit was stored without batteries, but at some point batteries had definitely leaked and caused grave destruction. This is the inside of the battery door. Solid metal, by the way. And you'll see there's a lot of corrosion. I had to scrape all that off and it really did a number to the metal. Um, the battery compartment itself isn't too bad off. The real problem is 
there is some corrosion that leaked and has affected the speaker frame. See right right about here there's some corrosion where the serial number is or the inspection certificate. There's some corrosion on the battery contacts. Not serious, but yeah, here we go. This is this is the damage I was referring to. There is some rust on the speaker itself and on the inner inner housing. And over here there is a little bit of corrosion. Oh, actually, no, this battery compartment looks okay in comparison. Um, I'm going to, at some point, crack this device open and try to find out what really went wrong here and see if it can be fixed. As for the speaker, I may end up finding a replacement speaker and popping it in. I mean, a lot of times they use standard off-the-shelf speakers, and just by replacing it, I can restore that, um, you know, not that there's anything wrong with the speaker, but I just don't like having corroded stuff in my devices. Any way to remove the corrosion is, is best. Oh, and the other thing is, the battery compartment is actually separated. These are two isolated compartments, and um, this is a fairly unusual design because it's nothing like they make today, but the motor is driven by one battery set, and it looks like they're wired in series, um, or I'm sorry, in parallel, so that they actually deliver maybe three and a half volts with full amperage. No, I'm sorry, one and a half volts with full amperage. Um, anyway, so there's that. The um, Like I said, a lot of earlier Japanese electronics used rechargeable batteries. Um, and this was no exception. That's what this little charging jack is for. It would have had a step-down transformer that plugs into here, and I don't think you'll ever find another one like it. Um, but it would have used a very early nickel metal, I'm sorry, NICAD battery pack to charge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, the amplifier is powered by one set of batteries, while the motor is powered by the other. So if I pull out one battery, um, I lose one or the other, <laughs> depending on which one I pull. Um, the unit is fully restorable, from what I can tell, except for one minor problem. At one point in time, it had been dropped or hit hard on one side, and uh, this particular belt loop um, um, point, uh, anchor point, is actually cracked. Now... This is pot metal, so I don't think I'll be able to solder it back together. Um, it's just going to have to stay the way it is, and I'm not going to put the belt loop back on. It's really more of an oddity at this point, because there aren't many of these left. And I don't think there were very many of these made. This device was manufactured or designed before the audio cassette standard had been established um, by Philips. Uh, the audio cassettes that you know and love today um, really became standard, I believe, sometime in the mid to late 1960s. And before that, um, every manufacturer was developing their own take on the compact cassette type um, media. And uh, and this is just one variant that I've seen. I, I know that there was one that I believe Sanyo had made, or one of the Japanese companies, and the tape was enormous, but it looked much like a modern cassette tape. When you pull this out, we'll take a look inside the uh, mechanism, and I'll show you just how simple it is. Um, looking down in there, um, you're going to see the back side of the, um, the, uh, the VU meter, or the battery meter. Right there, it says G something on it. And then you've got the two heads, one audio um, erase head, and one record read head. And I'm not sure which one is which at this point in time, but one of them, the audio uh, erase head, does not appear to be functional at this point. Um, and I've got to investigate and figure out why. Now, here we have the motor shaft. You can just barely see it. There it is. And that's the motor shaft that drives the cassette forward and backwards. Um, I'm going to go ahead and 
this is play. And you can see a locking pin comes out whenever the tape is engaged, or the motor is engaged. And that's to prevent you from pulling the tape out. This is where the locking pin um, contacts. But it's a very simple, very straightforward mechanism. Probably just one of the many early Japanese toy motors running this thing. And, um, and that's pretty much all there is to it. There's a, a pressure pad here. And that's just to keep the tape... Um, I believe it's just to keep tension on the tape. Just to prevent it from flying loose. So it doesn't really serve much of a purpose other than that. Um, yeah, these heads aren't even lined up. And there's a lot of... Um, I wonder if maybe the tarnish on this head is causing the problem. But it's a brass... It's a brass head, and I'm wondering if that might... So anyway, um, we're going to go ahead and put in the tape that I found. And I think I have it queued up for you all. I think it's this one here. Uh, Alright, here we go. City Council has been in business since 1885. Over 80 years, the old company. Our growth is the result of our excellent reputation. Our good standing as a member of the Better Business Bureau is your guarantee of satisfaction. The BBB does not tolerate complaints. Who else can qualify? Our comprehensive insurance coverage protects you. Aloy <laughs> Klaus will be in tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock to try and clear up this nail situation. But he wants to know the price that we're paying for our nails now. He said to be honest with him. Well, whatever this means, I don't know. Uh, Tom Roy, Bob uh, Howard, down below fabricating. Louis. He's down in the cellar. Uh, after he, uh... Hey, let's call the phone, guys. Rainbow Pools. I'm such a deal. Just called. Wanted a price for a cedar fence around a pool. I got a price of $450. Plus, this gate, which I said would run around, Twenty-five to thirty dollars. Oh, who knows if I'll hear from him or not. Thank you. 
of course, is the old coach of, uh, of Bucky Woods. He comes from the North Carolina State when he played there, and Bucky was his assistant. Vic was instrumental in getting up. I believe there's more. Wait for it. Oh, that could be it. I'm pretty sure there's more, though. There's no fast forward on this thing, so just increase the tape speed. No, I think that might be it. Alright, well, thanks for watching. Oh, one more thing. There's always more. Let's take a look at the owner's manual for the cassette channel master. I keep saying cassette master because cassette master is, well, the cassette master. Anyway, the model 6546. This is the owner's manual. It's pretty straightforward. Insert batteries, how to use it, how to turn it on. 32 minutes of playing time on your Channel Master tape cartridge. That must be both sides. So, hmm. There's a little button here. They call it the starter button. I'm not entirely certain what it does because my starter button doesn't work. It doesn't do anything when I press it. Um, so I'm not really sure what that's all about. Speed regulation, volume control, to playback. I mean, really nothing that... Uh, yeah. But the erase head doesn't work. Need to figure out why. Um, it had a 90 day, 90 day free replacement warranty. Unfortunately, that 90 days is up. So, Channel Master, Ellenville, New York. Alrighty.